The scripture reading for this afternoon comes from Acts 1, verses 6 through 8. Again, that's Acts 1, verses 6 through 8. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This is the word of the Lord. We ask that you now help us to turn towards you and <clears throat> to help our hearts be in a, in a place, a posture of receiving from you, of listening, or that you would help our eyes to see what you are saying in Scripture. You would give us ears to hear what you are saying. We just we really can't hear and understand what you're saying unless you open our ears and help us understand. So give us hearts that are not only receptive, but are able to understand, Lord, and so give us understanding as we lead. Help us to sense um, your leading and your move, moving uh, in us as a church to be the kind of church that lives intentionally on mission, trying to build relationships with non-unbelievers uh, and trying to share the gospel, trusting you for the results of faith in their life, Lord. And so we look to you and trust you to spur us on and encourage us um, in this moment, in my prayer. And, uh, <clears throat> um, what's, what's ironic about what Chad said is while I was sitting there listening to, to Gabe lead us in worship, I was just thinking, man, we ought to say something about um, thank you to people who, who have been leading us. So it's been really great, I think, to have people from, like Chad said, from Christ Redeemer Church, which is our sending church to be able to, to, to not just simply send people, but actually have people to be able to, to, to help out. And so really thankful for that, but also I just want to say thank you for all of you guys. Um, almost every single person who's sitting down has, has helped set up the room the way that it is. Um, from from this music stand that served as my pulpit to the TV, um, this whole place is filled with tables and they're gone because people show up around 2 3 to help. So thank you, all of you guys who, who help out week in week out so much. So I, I agree, and, and that wasn't Chad Point Road, that was being led by the Holy Spirit, so that was awesome. Um, so we've been going through a series on the core beliefs of our church, and so over the past, um, I think we've been meeting now for about six weeks, or just maybe one more extra, um, we've been going over the core beliefs of our church, and um, those core beliefs are the, the gospel word, the gospel community, and the gospel mission. And as you hear me say over and over again, these core beliefs really, um, really help explain, but also give guidance and, and picture and clarity to what kind of church we need to be. And so today... Um, Today we're, we're going to continue talking about that. Today will be the last sermon in that series, um, and we'll be talking about the gospel mission today. And so just so you know, these core beliefs are kind of like the pillars that we stand on. These will be unchanging for us. Um, they won't change. They'll be consistent. They might change in wording. <laughs> we might drop the gospel at some point. Maybe not. I don't think so. But I'm just saying, like, these core beliefs, they will always be the same. They'll be consistent. Um, so we'll talk about gospel mission today. And so God, he reveals himself through his word to us. And when I say the word, I actually, I, I'm talking about the Bible. You might hear the word or God's word as maybe just kind of like a Christian, Christianese kind of thing. Um, but what I mean by that is the Bible. And, and in God's word to us, through it, we understand how the gospel changes everything. Um, how the gospel changes the way that I view who God is, the way that I view and understand myself, the way that I view um, even the creation itself, how I respond to it realizing and understanding that I am an image bearer. Every single person, you don't have to be a Christian to be an image bearer. That's what you are. 
and you are designed to, to bring stewardship to the rest of creation, to bring dominion, as it says in Genesis. And so the gospel helps us, reminds us of that, brings clarity to that. And, and the gospel, is, if you, and we say that all the time, and so I want to just say what it is, but the gospel is about what God has done to restore humanity, rebellious, sinful humanity, to himself. And by restoring humanity to himself, he restores us in, in right relationship with him, in right relationship to each other. Um, just think about that. Without the gospel, we won't be able to be restored in right relationship to each other. So God restores us to himself to make that happen. And then he restores us to a right understanding of our world and how to live as stewards. And the way that he does that is through his son Jesus' death and resurrection. That's huge. Just, just one moment in time created the effect to be able to cause transformation to happen in people's hearts. Um, and so through Jesus' death and resurrection, God saves us. He saves us from the punishment and guilt of our sins. He is, he is now in the... So that's a past thing, right? He did that in the past. But God is also now, in this moment, saving us from the power of sin, right? He has saved us, rescued us, almost ripped us from the grip of sin in our life, but also continually saving us from its power more and more so that we live free um, from sin. We won't be perfect um, in this life. That'll only come when Jesus returns, but, but he is saving us from his power so that we are free to worship him. But he's also continually saving us from the presence of sin. One of the things that people sleep on all the time is, is that the, the, the evil, the corruption, the wrong that happens in our world is a product of sin in our world. Because of Adam and Eve's sin, uh, we have those things. And so literally, because Adam and Eve's sin, everything has gone wrong. And I would argue it's not just them, but it would have been us too. And so God is saving us from the presence of sin. And so God, he's on this mission to restore people to himself um, through this message, which is the gospel. All that I just shared with you is the gospel message. And what he does is he creates a new people. A new people who, who live not only restored to him, but to each other, and they go out with this message. Um, this beautiful, life-giving message that brings restoration. Hence, that's where we get our name from as a church to our world. And so, and so the big thing you should know is that the gospel is something God has done. And it's not what we do. The gospel is what God is still doing, and it has nothing to do with us. In terms of the saving, in terms, in terms of the transforming, in terms of the rescuing, that's all God. That's none of us. And so you might ask, man, then what, and what's my purpose? And what you see in Acts uh, chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, it shows us that God, he, he includes us in that mission. He saves us, rescues us, and then he includes us in the mission. So we were part of the mission. We were part of the mission of, of, of being rescued, and now he sends us on a mission with him. To, to go and redeem people through saying, hey, this is what Jesus has done. And so these set of verses is just one place in the Bible. We, we, I wish we had, I wish we could just sit here for a long time, maybe play board games and talk about all the different places we see these things in Scripture, but, but this is just one place where we see and understand this core belief of gospel mission, that God's on a mission. And the mission that God is on is to declare the gospel. And so... So what Jesus does for us in these verses is he just he adjusts our understanding of our purpose by aligning it with, with God's purpose. He, he takes the disciples' eyes, he takes their understanding, and he helps them understand that the way that they're going to understand their purpose is by looking and understanding what God's mission is. And so Jesus, he helps us understand God's mission by showing us two things, and that's, that's the way we're going to walk through these verses. He shows them the scope of the mission, and then the power for the mission. The scope of the mission, the power for the mission. Let's look at the scope of the mission. So in the book of Acts, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a part two of the Gospel of Luke. If you've ever if you ever read Luke um, chapter one, he talks to this guy named Theophilus. And here again in Acts, if you look at chapter one, verse one, he's talking to Theophilus again. Uh, we don't really know who Theophilus is, but we do know that he he was an educated person. He was very interested in the things of Christianity. And so this is part two. And, and Luke himself, he was the Apostle Paul's companions on all of Paul's missionary journeys. So if you read the whole book of Acts, you'll notice that, that it's being written from a, a third-person view, and all of a sudden he includes himself in the lead right um, And so Luke is the author, and, uh, and you see all of Paul's missionary journeys in the book of Acts. 
And Acts really shows us how God the Father, he really continues his mission after Jesus ascends to heaven to be with them forever until he returns. But before, before Jesus ascends, Jesus gives these last parting words to his disciples. And so he tells them in verse 4 through 5, by the way, if you have a Bible, I encourage you to look at it, but they're going to be in the screen if you don't have one. But in verses 4 through 5, he tells them not to leave Jerusalem. They need to wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. So let's just read it verbatim. He says, And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. <clears throat> and so, when they hear the word promise, they're thinking that God's going to restore the kingdom of Israel the way that it used to be in the past. So, ooh, that sounds like hard. Um, they thought that God's going to restore the kingdom of Israel the way that it used to be in the past. So they're thinking, man, we're going to go back to the glory days. And so, and, and you know that they're wondering about that because they asked Jesus in verse 6, Lord, look at the bold. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And so when you read the Old Testament prophets, you see that God's disciplined Israel for their disobedience, for walking in disobedience, and he essentially takes the kingdom away from them. And so then there's this promise from Old Testament prophets as well, where they foretell that God would restore their kingdom. And one place you see that is in Micah 4, 8. It's going to be on the screen for you. It says this, and you, O tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, you, to you shall it come, the former dominion shall come, kings for the daughter of Jerusalem. So their expectation was the glory days. They are thinking, okay, we're going to be the kingdom we used to be, because Israel, they used to be the thing. They used to be the, the baddest kingdom. Small crew, but man, they were dynamic. And people wanted to be a part of them. People feared them because they feared God. And they're just thinking, man, we're no longer going to be the crumbs of the earth kind of thing. But then Jesus adjusts their expectation. And he does that in two ways. So first, he takes their eyes off of the future. He, he tells them in verse 7, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. So they're so focused on, on how God's going to do it, when God's going to do it. But Jesus is essentially saying, that's not for you to know. Uh, translation, that's not your business. <laughs> you don't need to know that right now. That's not what you need in order to be able to be obedient to what God is saying. They're thinking, hey, Jesus, you're leaving us, and we need some direction, so let us know when's it going to happen. But then Jesus adjusts their expectation. And he is essentially saying to them, listen, God is sovereign. Which means that God is in control of all things. He's in control of when, the how, and and and. and and just exactly the exact way it's going to happen. And so Jesus, he tells, he tells them not to worry about this, but then brings clarity by talking about what God's going to do now. And that's the second way he helps adjust their expectation. He puts their focus on what God is doing now. He tells them in verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, and all Judea, and Samaria, to the end of the earth. So, Expecting God to rebuild the kingdom of Israel, they're thinking, just like Jesus says in Matthew 5, they're going to be like lights. But Jesus, what he does for them is he shifts the playing field. They're not supposed to be focused on rebuilding the kingdom so that people draw to them. What, they're, what he's actually calling them to do is this, instead of being a people who draw people to them, they now become a people who go out to people. So instead of saying, hey, come look at us, they are saying, hey, look what God has done. We want to bring it to you. Essentially, what, what Jesus is telling them is your responsibility now is to take the kingdom of God to people. And so they're going to start from Jerusalem, and then they're, they're to move outward towards Judea, then they're to move further out to Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And holy buckets. Like, Paul didn't, I don't think Paul knew of Antarctica. I think he just knew as far as Rome. But just think about the ends of the earth. So my kids are, my kids and I were watching Pocahontas on Disney Plus a couple weeks, uh, a couple weekends ago. And um, it's near the climax of the movie. And so there's this, like, weird living, moving grandma, kind of like Willow Tree. You've seen that movie? And it's just weird. I mean, she just, she kind of looks scary to me. And I'm 32. Um, but she's, she's talking to them about 
hey, this is what's going to bring peace. Because what's happening is the native people and then, and then the England treasure hunters, that's what I call them. I don't know what their like, appropriate title is. But they're like, they're about to battle. And she's like, what's going to bring peace? And so Pocahontas and John Smith are trying to like, figure out what to do. And so she's like, just look at this. And she takes her like, weird leaf kind of finger and just taps the water. And it just, it's like this weird iconic moment where everything like, just focuses on the ripple and just looks really beautiful. And then she tells them, one act starts out small, but then it spreads over time. And so the act in the Bible and in our world is Jesus' death and resurrection. The ripple effect was not to focus on building, rebuilding Israel to draw people to it. The ripple effect is actually to, to send out witnesses, people, out to the different corners of the world as they would think about it. Really, the earth is round, so there's really no corners. But, but to the different parts of the world to take the gospel out. And so, through Jesus, the kingdom of God, it touches down on earth in this world. And the ripple effect is to, to be witnesses who go out and take the kingdom. We go out, we move out, we begin talking about what God has done in us so that we share with people what God is doing to make available in them. So that's the picture he's giving. And so the kind of church I think I believe, not I think, I'm confident in that, I believe that God calls all churches to, is to be this kind of people, to be the kind of people who go out rather than draw people in. And so our mission isn't to, to draw people to our service. And you're like, what? The mission isn't to draw people to our service. We'll talk about that in a second. But our mission is actually to go out to people in West St. Paul and the surrounding communities, share the gospel, invite them into the Christ-centered community, and teach them what it looks like to follow Christ. And so notice that Jesus, he isn't talking to one person. He's talking to many disciples. He's, they're, they're, they're a gospel community. And we've talked about the gospel community being a group of believers who have been, or a group of people who have been saved by Jesus, brought into community because of Jesus, and they gather to live, to do life together, and to live on mission together. And so, this gospel community he's talking about, they go out to share Jesus, what he has done for others because of what he has done in them. And so this is why, this is why I've told you in the past, the main goal, our main goal is not to really invite people to our church, but rather to invite them to the gospel community. And then for you to engage them with the gospel as a group in your gospel community, to invite them in, to walk with them, to show them what it looks like to follow Christ, because this Christ has called you to that. And so this text is one of the many places in Scripture that, that really shows you that the church really is a missionary church. God's called every single Christian, I believe, I think you see it in scripture to be missionaries. Not just abroad, not just overseas, but here, in your own city, in your own backyard. And so <clears throat> I know that kind, of, that kind of sounds scary because I think the way that we've we've been taught to do evangelism for such a long time is there's that one dynamic person who can like really draw a crowd, who can really share Jesus, and we just we just get we order pizza, we tell them to come, maybe there's some donuts, maybe there's some Mountain Dew. And we just tell them to come, and we, we let them listen to that person. But really, you won't see that in the scriptures. You won't see that in the scriptures. But instead, you see like in places like Ephesians 3, where he says, where Paul tells the church, God's plan is to show his manifold wisdom. It's not on the screen. His manifold wisdom that through the church, people might know the mystery of the gospel. Which is, Jesus, people are able to come know Christ, every single person from every tribe, nation, and tongue, through the church, through his people. And so, so let me be clear, I'm not saying never. <laughs> I'm never saying, I'm not saying never invite anybody to our church service. That's not what I'm saying, because um, one of the reasons why we set up our service the way that it is, so that people can clearly hear what the gospel, what we, what I believe and what, what we believe as a church is, is that the gospel is not just for the non-Christian, but it's also for the believer. Like Colossians 2, Paul talks about, hey, continue on with what you started. Like what you, as, you, as you receive Christ, so walk in him is what Colossians 2, 6 says. And so the gospel is for the believer. But what I, what I want to impress upon us is it's not just the Sunday gathering. Uh, Non-believing people and actually Christians need to see what does it look like 
to live like an everyday Christian in everyday life. And the way that that happens is when we do life together. Is when we eat together, we share each other's burdens, we share each, other, each other's joys, we pray together, we laugh together, we cry together, we walk together. And so we absolutely, absolutely invite your friends to the Sunday gathering. Right? Absolutely invite your friends here. Like invite them. Start inviting them. Also invite them into your gospel community group. Invite them in into your life. Share a meal. Talk with them. Hang out with them. Laugh with them. Game with them. Watch sports with them. Watch the Vikings. Almost win. Watch the Timberwolves. Almost win. Enjoy the sorrows with them. And so talk, and, and, and then after you invite them, talk to them about the gospel. Intentionally go into West St. Paul and the surrounding communities thinking big, B-I-G. So B-I-G stands for, if it's going to be on screen, yep, it's one more. build relationships with unbelievers, invite them into the, your gospel community group, and then share the gospel with them. And so just think about this. What is our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and into the earth? Our Jerusalem is West St. Paul. Our Samaria, or our Judea, is the surrounding cities. Our Samaria is our nation. And our ends of the earth is the globe. And so God is, man, God is, God is, believe it or not, He is calling you, He's calling me to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth in some way. I don't know how, I don't know when, I don't know what it looks like. All I know is that He's calling us to it. So let's trust him. Let's look to him and let's ask, Lord, how are you sending me? I know for sure he's sending us to our neighbors, to our co-workers. He's, he's placed us. It's ridiculous how easy it has been to come into West St. Paul, even in the midst of COVID, right? We, we were going to meet in Heritage High School, and then this fell on our lap. And by the way, the, the, the co-founder, one of the co-founders is for us, not a believer. How does that happen unless God's with so I want to speak to the fear and to the intimidation of going out and sharing the gospel because I just, I'm convinced, even myself, like, just not accustomed to that. How do we do that? How do we, how do you become equipped for that kind of thing? What do you need in order to be able to do that? I think Jesus speaks to that in verse 8. Because someone might ask, how do I, how, what am I supposed to do to be equipped to live that way? And let's look at verse 8. This is where Jesus talks about the power for the mission. <clears throat> look, at, look at me with, uh, look at it with me what Jesus says in verse 8. He says this about the role of the Holy Spirit. He says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And, and I would add, then you will be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends end of the earth. And so the promise in verse 4 is the Holy Spirit. That's what he's telling them in a way. He's telling them in a way for the Holy Spirit and you know that because he begins talking immediately about the Holy Spirit right after he says, waiting for the promise. And so the reason why Jesus tells them to wait for the Holy Spirit is because when the Holy Spirit comes, he will be their power. And when you look at it, when you look at it, and you understand, like you look at what, what it's saying in, this, in the Greek, it is basically saying the ability. It is saying the know-how. Like we're talking about tangible, what am I supposed to do? What's, what's my next step? The Holy Spirit. He's your power. He's your ability to be his witnesses. And so they won't be able to share the gospel effectively unless the Holy Spirit comes. That's a crazy thing to think about. They could have, they could have not listened. They, they could have tried to share the gospel. In fact, there's a story about the sons of Sceva. Go read Acts. And they, they think that they can just do what Jesus is doing and they get beat naked. They get the clothes beat off of them because they're not empowered by the Holy Spirit, by demons. And so how important it is. They could have, the disciples could have gone, but Jesus to wait and wait and they're empowered. And they do things they would have never done before without the Holy Spirit. So just a note about the Holy Spirit. He's not just he's not some kind of power that you can just do whatever you want with. He's not, he's not at the disposal of, of a person. See, there's a, there is actually a segment of Christianity where the Holy Spirit is kind of like used to make a Christian on like a super level, like this like this like extra ordinary person. But that's not what this passage is saying, and that's not what the scriptures teach. The Holy Spirit does use people to do miracles, but that's not the main emphasis 
of the Holy Spirit. It's one of the byproducts of the Spirit's work in people's lives. And, and sometimes He does that in some people and sometimes not in others. But the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. He, he is His separate own being. So there's the God the Father, there's God the Son, and then there's God the Holy Spirit. Three in one, in unity and harmony, He has His own personality. And He has His own mission. So we just can't use the power that we want to. So listen to what Jesus says about the reason why he sends the Holy Spirit. It says in, uh, in John 16, starting in verse 8, <clears throat> all the way to 15, it says, And when he, talking about the Holy Spirit, comes, he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Talking about Satan. And I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he, talking about the Spirit, will not speak on his own authority. For whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me. For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said, he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And so the Holy Spirit, he accompanies the Christian. He empowers them. He makes the message that they speak effective to land on their ears and all of a sudden begin to melt in their heart and for it to make sense to them. He guides them every step of the way. So your power literally is the gospel. Believe it or not. That sounds like maybe spooky or weird, but it's real. It is your power. So John Piper, he gives this example in his book, Future Grace, of how the Holy Spirit works with the gospel in someone's life to free them from the power of sin. And I would argue it, it's the same effect that the gospel brings in someone's life. And so he gives this picture of a car driving with mud on its windshield. And he says this, the windshield wipers are the promises of God, which is the gospel that clear away the mud of unbelief. And the windshield washer fluid is the help of the Holy Spirit. The battle to be freed from sin is by the Spirit and by faith and truth. The work of the Spirit and the word of truth, these are the great faith builders. Without the softening work of the Holy Spirit, the wipers of the word just scrape over the blinding clumps of unbelief. Both are necessary the Spirit, and the Word. So what sin does to us is it distorts our view of life. It muddies it by muddying it up. And when the windshield wipers of the gospel turn on, the Holy Spirit comes on and softens the mud so that it clears away the filth of the sin from your eyes. Softens the muddy view of life, and then the gospel gives you a clearer view of who God is. It clarifies. <laughs> and so when you speak, so don't be ashamed of speaking the gospel because know that the Spirit is with you. And sometimes it takes a while, right? Like, I mean, if you've ever turned your windshield wiper, wipers on with fluid to get like a lot of dirt off, it takes a while. And sometimes it just takes a while in someone's life. But that promise is there for you. And so when you look at what Jesus says, he is telling the disciples that when the Holy Spirit comes, he will give them a sense of boldness. And they will go out. They will become vehicles, no pun intended, for the gospel. They will become vehicles for the gospel. <clears throat> and the Holy Spirit, he makes things clear to people. So they don't, they don't need to know how this is supposed to work. The Holy Spirit, he leads them where they're supposed to go. And like John 16 says, he would remind them of all that Jesus taught. He will bring it to memory. Like those moments when you're talking with someone, and all, all of a sudden you have a portion of scripture come to your mind. That wasn't your amazing intellect. That was the Holy Spirit working in and giving you the words to say. And so in the book of Acts, every time a disciple, read it, read the book of Acts, every time they're scared, every time they don't know what to do or say, or where people believe, the Holy Spirit is present right there, every time. And so look at how Jesus makes this possible. He ascends. <laughs> he literally goes away. Because if he didn't go away, the Holy Spirit wouldn't have come. So he, he goes to be with his Father so that he could send more of himself. <laughs> more of himself to people. So just think about this picture. Just think about this picture. 
It could have been that Jesus would have been this rocking, awesome mega church like pastor. It could have been that guy. But he ascends and he puts his spirit in people so that where his people are, his kingdom is expanding. So having one massive light, there are many lights that make a really bright light wherever you are. Because his spirit is in you. And so this isn't this isn't to say you shouldn't read theology, theology books. It's not to say you shouldn't go to seminary or you shouldn't study. It's not to say any of those things. But what this does mean is what they need and what you need is just simply the Holy Spirit, the Word, and the Gospel. So you don't you don't need to know a lot to lead people to faith in Christ. You don't need to know a lot in order for people to know the gospel. All you need is the word, the gospel, and the Holy Spirit. But reading theology does help. I read it. I'd be a, I'd be a hypocrite and a fool to tell you not to read it when I'm reading it, like all day. So you can read theology. It's, it's not a bad thing. It's great. It helps with understanding. It helps with understanding the Christian, uh, what Christians believe, what Orthodox Christianity is. But to share the gospel, again, all you need, read your Bible. I would encourage you to read it yearly if you can. There's also plans to read it, read the Bible in a total of three years or two years. But read your Bible. Know the story of Scripture. We did this, we did this study called The Story Formed Way. Take a group of people and go through that to know the story of Scripture. Then know the, know the gospel. Know, know what Jesus has done through his death and resurrection. And then pray and trust and rely on the Holy Spirit. So when you're fearful, instead of wondering what to do, get on your knees before the Lord and ask Him. Ask Him. So by Jesus' ascension, He gives you the promise of the Holy Spirit on purpose to embolden you. He wants you to rely on the Spirit. He wants you to. He, he wants you to do that. And that's how you would do it. So the reason why the gospel mission is one of our core beliefs is because we believe that God is constantly on mission. Like right now, as we are sitting here and you're hearing me preach, God is currently on mission. He is engaging in the lives of people who are outside of these walls. And we want to join them in that mission. So Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. So the person, the purpose of the Christian is to live in community on gospel mission together. That literally is the person, our purpose for every Christian. And so God's mission is to take the gospel from Jerusalem, and we can say metaphorically Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And our Jerusalem, let's say Paul, our Judea, surrounding communities. Our Samaria, our nation. Our ends of the earth. So, I think instead of our primary mission strategy being to draw people to our service, Jesus calls us to go out. So I just want to ask you guys, I was going to speak to you as you hear this sermon. What, what is he stirring in you? Maybe what kind of people group? We like to talk about that. What kind of people group? Is he calling you to reach in what's in all surrounding communities? I want to encourage you to be obedient to that, respond to that. And let the primary place that you invite people to to be in your gospel community. Yes, invite them here. Invite them next Sunday. Also invite them into your gospel community. Invite them for a meal. Talk with them. Hang out with them. Laugh with them. So, Andy, can you just put on the logo really quick? Um, the reason why we made the logo the way it is because I wanted to be able to give you guys a tool for how to share the gospel, but also to say what we're about. And literally, these these three logos are the gospel word, the gospel community, and the gospel mission. And so, the Bible is really a story of the gospel. It's a life-giving message that, that that goes out and creates a people, and that people turn to the word to know who God is and understand the gospel, and they take that gospel message and they go on mission to create more people who believe in Jesus. And it's all centered around the cross and the gospel. We are centered on the gospel. And so that's that's why we believe the gospel we're the gospel community and the gospel mission because with these three things it really summarizes what God is doing in the scriptures and what he's calling us to. He asks us to join him on mission. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, thank you so much that you that you you not only call us to join you, but you also empower us. You you give us what we need to do to be on mission. 
And Lord, I just ask you, Lord, that you would help us to uh, not only trust your spirit, but also to also experience your spirit's work in our life. Lord, we need that. The Holy Spirit is one of the most neglected doctrines of scripture, or it's, or it's taken out of context. And Lord, would you give us a healthy view of the Holy Spirit? Would you help us not to be afraid of trusting and relying on the Holy Spirit, Lord, and, and to do that in a way where we, where we live dependent rather than trying to be independent. So help us to respond to your message of grace and peace to us through Jesus Christ.